Hi everyone, good evening. Um, my name is Safia, I'm the Arts and Events Coordinator at Bow Arts. Um, uh, thanks for joining us today for our live Q&A event with Nye Thompson and Sophie Hill. Um, so yeah, this is our second event for Visions in the Nunnery 2020. Um, hopefully some of you had a chance to see the exhibition in real life before it closed. Um, but if not, obviously, um, I've sent you the link around to Nye's film online and all of the Visions in the Nunnery um, Programme 1 and Programme 2 artworks are on the Bow Arts YouTube. So they're available to view uh, at your leisure anytime, anytime now. Um, just a little bit of digital housekeeping. Um, so if you could keep yourselves on mute um, as well throughout the session, if possible. Um, and then you'll have a chance to unmute yourselves and ask questions if you like when we get to that part. Um, you can have your camera on or off, as I said. Um, nice to see faces, but if your circumstances don't allow, that's fine. Um, we have the lovely chat box here, um, which I'll just type into to say hello so you can see it. Um, so do feel free to put any comments, questions, um, or just say hello in the chat box at any point throughout. Um, we are recording the session, I hope, um, but that's just for archiving, uh, archiving purposes. So only the speakers will be recorded. Um, audience members would only be recorded if you chose to ask a question um, at some point in the session. So if you do that and you don't want your camera or your face uh, recorded, then just switch your camera off at that point. Um, this is a public event. So your Zoom name and again, your picture and video will be visible to everyone. Um, and anything you share in the chat box will also be public. Um, that's all the boring stuff out of the way. Um, so for those of you who don't know Bow Arts, um, we are primarily an artist studios provider and we have 13 studio sites across East and Southeast London. Um, so that's over 300 practicing artists uh, working under our roof. Um, we also have a learning department who work with artist educators in local schools. And then of course we have the Nunnery Gallery, which is um, where Visions in, in the Nunnery is housed. Uh, and it's our main public space for exhibitions and events. Uh, we have about three to four exhibitions per year uh, and we tend to focus on East London and the history of the local area, um, particularly giving a platform to emerging artists, um, which is where Visions comes to play. Um, so Visions was established in 1999 um, and it's Beaux Arts Biennial Exhibition of Moving Image, Digital and Performance Art, uh, selected from an international open call. Um, this year we have three lead artists, um, Hatane Patel, who was Programme One's lead artist, Nai Thompson, who we have here today, who's leading Programme Two, and Benedict Drew. Um, and their work guides the themes of the three unique programmes of the exhibition. Uh, a big thank you to Arts Council England for supporting the exhibition this year um, and this year's selectors Tessa Garland, Sophie Hill and Camilla Cook, along with the lead artists as well. Um, sadly, Nye's programme too in the Nunnery Gallery has had to close shortly, just hopefully for a short while. Um, but like I said, you can watch all of the works online um, and you'll be able to watch Nye's film online as well until 9pm this evening. So um, if you haven't had a chance to watch that already, then do get onto the Bow Arts YouTube after this um, and have a watch. Um, so I'll now pass on to Sophie, um, who can introduce our lovely guest. Um, and please remember to put any questions in the chat box throughout and we'll try and get to those at, um, at one point or another. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question yourself, you can wave at us or type something in the chat box and we'll, we'll come and call you out and you can unmute yourself. Um, so that's great. I will now pass over to Sophie and Nai, who will both say hello, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, so Nye um, Thompson doesn't need much introduction, I'm just going to say a little bit. Um, she calls herself an artist turned software designer turned artist again. 
Um, so following a stint as a corporate software engineer, um, Nai then used these skills to push boundaries in the digital art world, um, writing software systems into artware to explore artwork, to explore new technologies. And I think this is really, you know, why we invited her to be a Visions lead artist, because um, Visions is all about championing, championing how, you know, the boundaries can be pushed in digital media um, and the sort of very cutting edge, um, you know, techniques and ways um, artists um, using film all over the world and so we couldn't really ignore um, Dear Nye on our doorstep, um, uh, one of our artists in our um, Bow Arts uh, studios on Bow Road. Um, and her work's been shown all over the world, um, in the UK just to name a few at Tate Modern, v &A, The Lowry, um, her piece Insulae is enjoying its second showing at the Barbican at the moment, just opened, um, which is great, I went to see the first one, it's yeah very brilliant. Um, and of course, her new work, Artifact, is headlining um, our Visions programme too. Um, so I'm going to kick off talking about Artifact, um, just because that's the work um, that obviously we're showing and um, hopefully you've all seen recently. Um, Artifact exploits data systems to build a virtual wall um, on Mars, um, just this huge, colossal black wall, amazing. Um, as you sort of go across the surface of Mars, these kind of pockets, this orange, you've got the sky above you. It's, um, it's an incredibly powerful work. Um, it's got an amazing soundtrack. Um, and the two weeks um, it did have in our gallery, um, it kind of fascinated everyone. My favorite visitors were these school kids, which um, walked up our gallery alleyway um, every evening and they always pop in to, to have a trip to Mars, um, which I just thought was brilliant um, and great. And get, you know, that's our kind of aim to engage people who live locally and, and boy, were they engaged. Um, and I actually just had a question for Nai about the title because I never asked you this, Nai, and I don't know why it's called Artifact. So tell me, please tell me. <laughs> well, first of all, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. And thank you for inviting me to do this talk. It's really, um, and also to be in the Visions programme um, and for the, for the lovely intro, Sophie. Um, and yeah, I love that story about the school kids who said it was like being in a spaceship which is really good. So the title of the work, it's actually, not, it's not artifact, it's slash artifact. Right, sorry. Because it's got the, um, the backslash at the beginning. Um, and I guess I possibly coming back to my years in software, um, you know, because software systems are often my medium, um, I tend to take my titles from the, the kind of, um, uh, tropes and sort of typical structures um, of software naming. Um, so when I was first thinking about what to call it, um, artifact came, I mean, an artifact obviously has a couple of meanings. One, obviously being um, uh, like a sort of a major sort of historic object, which is what I was thinking of for the wall. Um, but also an artifact is a kind of a glitch um, introduced into an image um, typically through some software process um, so for both of those kind of reasons I thought that was really nice but actually artifact is also quite a well-used word but I wanted it to um, I wanted to differentiate and in fact the slash at the beginning is a reference to the wall yeah so mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah and then I thought you know slash artifact is just um, yeah, I, I also kind of like the sort of um, the cadence of it. Uh, but yeah, so that, that, that's why, slash artifact. Uh -huh. I kind of sort of like to think that, you know, just thinking on all the different planes and that's what your work makes you do. It kind of thinks outside of our world and in the digital world that you were kind of leaving a digital artifact to forever be on Mars because in some, you know, space or another, there will always now be a wall on Mars if you're kind of looking at Mars you know, through your lens. And so I thought that was an interesting yeah. idea um, yeah. as yeah, well. Exactly. Yeah, so, um, and I wondered, did you, because you've, so Insulae, for those who haven't seen it, is um, a work, again, that uses satellite imagery and it traces the borders of the UK. Um, so it's kind of, it's above the world, but then you're kind of going above again mm -hmm. um, with, um, with that artifact up into space. And I wondered, was that kind of a conscious progression from kind of stepping up and up and up? Um, or did you sort of just, yeah, 
Yeah, I, I in in a way, I mean, I'm really interested in this kind of um, satellite gaze um, and the way that it forces us to look at the world. So this sort of strange um, vertical view of the world, which has become kind of such a, um, you know, it's sort of become um, absorbed in our sort of cultural aesthetics, um, but it's also, um, it changes the way that you look at the world. And in a way, this sort of um, satellite view, it changes the world into sort of, it changes like socio, social geography into aesthetics. Um, yeah. And, you know, people call it like a kind of God gaze. Um, the impact of looking at a world from that perspective is very different to our human sort of vertical walking along the surface of the world. Um, and I think it encourages us, I think in a way that was sort of one of the things that made me do work, made me create Flash Artifact. So this satellite view, I think it sort of encourages um, these sort of um, megalomanic um, attitudes to the world when you look down and the people are so small and insignificant. And, you know, it, I think it's quite interesting because Mars obviously is, is the first planet that we have got to know through this gaze, you know, only through this sort of vertical top-down satellite gaze rather than from the sort of walking along the surface. Um, and I think that kind of view, in a way, it does encourage these sort of massive hubristic schemes like, um, okay, we're going to terraform it, we're going to drop, um, you know, um, nuclear bombs to um, fill the atmosphere with, um, you know, particles so it will heat up the surface. Um, it changes the way that we think about um, it, that, that view changes the way that we think about things. I'm also super interested in this sort of satellite gaze because this um, this view of the world, you know, we look at it and we look at things like Google Earth and all this satellite and we're like, oh, it's really beautiful, it's really pretty. But what's kind of hidden behind that is the fact that the purpose of this viewpoint and all the, you know, the primary purpose of these things is it's military, you know, and in the end, that, that's what drives all of this satellite imaging. I know it's used for other purposes, but the primary driver is military with the, you know, the idea being that if you can see an area, um, you can drop a bomb on it. Yeah. Um, and I'm quite interested in the way that this sort of, um, this, it's not subtext in a way because it's like the sort of overarching um, text, but the way this is kind of hidden within this sort of, um, this thing which has become part of our cultural aesthetics. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's interesting though, because you you definitely get that with Insulae, because you're it's it's a very I mean it's a very beautiful work because it's you know you for those of you who haven't seen it you get these colours of the sea and the colours of the landscape and, and the way it changes. I mean, if anything, it's also like it's a tour around Britain, right? As well, well you know, yeah. really. But but you're always you are always very distant. What I found interesting about um, slash artifact is you know you do feel distant, and of course you know you do get this aerial view. But also, you know, like the kids were so excited, you're all also like plummeted across the surface of Mars. You know, it's quite exciting. There's real movement in there and you kind of, you get closer than I thought you would do with that imagery. And how, how much is that you kind of playing, like zooming in and stitching things together to kind of give us that roller coaster, or, or, or is it, or is it, is, you know, is that, is that what it's already like? I mean, that is what it's already like, but yes, you're right. Um, um, I think when I, because Slash Artifact went through all of these metamorphoses, it was obviously it was commissioned before COVID and its original implementation was going to be something quite different. Um, and I kind of actually remade the piece in lockdown into something which is much more intimate. Um, I think so you, in a way, I've kind of replaced that top down view with kind of quite a sort of visceral um, feel as if you are actually nearly on the surface. Um, and, you know, very personally blocked out by the huge wall that I've created. Um, but that is genuinely, um, you know, the surface of Mars. That's a, it's terribly, you know, it's one of the interesting things is it, it's so, the um, scales of things are, so, um, are so, so much larger than on Earth. You know, huge caverns and these enormous mountains. We actually end up um, in Olympus Mons, um, which you probably know is, is like the the tallest volcano in the solar system. Um, so that, yeah, th those sort of scales are just really, um, 
breathtaking. And I did want to include How much of the that. imagery did you use that you found? Like, had you, you know, if you're stitching it all together, was there, did you find room for it all or actually was there tons that? There was so much. Yeah. I, I actually um, prepared so much. Um, I mean, Insulae, which you mentioned before, um, the journey around the UK, it's um, six hours long. Um, and I think when I started thinking about Slash Artifact, I was going to work on this sort of, this sort of time scale, you know, this, this really, really long journey. Um, but sort of as it, um, as it changed um, and evolved into the state you, you see now, um, it made sense to make it um, much more, more, more of a, a short film. So I had to rigorously just prune out a few of my favorite um, scenes, but, um, but yeah, there could have been a lot more. And then I kind of, um, there's a hot, I sort of collated it. You'll sort of see there's a, um, a progression from uh, day to night as you move through. Yeah, um, and then you also start time. off um, on this sort of quite sort of level ground. It's quite slow and then it sort of gets, bumpier and bumpier until you end up in this kind of massive um, crescendo. Or oh, actually, um, you were mentioned before, a quick shout out to uh, Joanna Penso. Um, I think she wouldn't be here tonight, but did the, um, you know, so we worked together to make this amazing sound. Yeah, the sound is amazing. If yeah. um, Hopefully, when we open again in December and continue with Nice program, it, even if you've seen it, the online version, you really must go to the gallery and see the sound if you can, because it's it's immense. It's kind of, you get these really quiet bits and then this sort of sub roof kind of huge, you know, and it, it does, I mean, I don't know idea what space sounds like, but I feel like you've, we've got a little close <laughs> to the impact. Um, I yeah. want to talk a bit um, about um, my first introduction to your work, Nai, right. which was Backdoored, um, which was um, one of your early projects. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know, very, very, in a nutshell, this is a sort of collection of screenshots um, that Nye sort of um, programmed the software to collect from compromised security um, cameras from all over the world. Um, and it's a couple of years since the project now. So this was actually um, one of the first talks I ever staged um, in the Nunnery Gallery back in 2016. And I think the project went on to 2018. Um, it was a little bit um, controversial later on. Um, <laughs> but um, for me, sort of thinking about it now, I guess it highlighted a couple of things, the kind of the, the laid bare aspect of our lives, you know, which we, we have is just, we're under constant surveillance. And in, in this case, a lot of it was voluntary because people hadn't managed to program their, <laughs> their sort of in-house surveillance um, properly. So, you know, it was really laid bare. And then that idea of the kind of control between machines and us, because, you know, people had bought these systems, but then they hadn't programmed them to be private. So then, you know, the machine has a massive element of control there. And I just wondered, Nai, you know, with a couple of years since the project, how you reflect on it and what, if you've got any more sort of, I don't know, recollections or, yeah, yeah comments. All right, so I mean, that project backdoored, in a way, it was, it was like the foundation of, I, I guess, everything I've done since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and my whole sort of interest in the idea of a machine, a machine gaze a sort of, and a machine agency. Um, that is an idea of machine agency sort of emerging through the interstices of these super complex, unpredictable systems that we're building up around us. Um, and the images in, in Backdoor, I mean, Backdoor was I mean, um, was, was, was interesting in, in so many ways, um, but, I think the when I started, I was thinking about surveillance. And surveillance has been obviously it's been a kind of theme throughout my work. I mean, even now, as you say, we're talking about the you know the satellite imagery. You know, it's there for surveillance purposes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not quite as intimate as the sort of home surveillance, but um, it, it still forms part of it. But what really um, what stayed with me um, from those from backdoored was the the images themselves and kind of the idea of what exactly they were um so i mean you know the first thing was like, oh my goodness you know insecure um security cameras um you know people aren't putting on passwords it's all very you know it, it, it's we're all sort of exposed but um 
I was just really fascinated. I mean, the way that these images occurred. Um, so I used to collect them from um, sort of security testing uh, websites, the Internet of Things. Um, and the way that they would occur is that a um, search algorithm would find, um, uh, it would travel around the internet and it would find an unsecured um, webcam. Um, and when it did, it would actually take an image or as a record of um, what it found and it would move on to the next one. Um, but I was just very interested in this idea of these images which were kind of created with little or no human agency. Um, and kind of in what was sort of what what was emerging in that sort of notion of you know these um, uh, machines creating images of our world, um, and really in about how to think about systems like this, which are just so unthinkably complex. You know, there's something like that. It's a combination of like people errors, hardware errors, software errors network systems doing other things, just this really, really complex, um, unpredictable sort of combination of things leading to these unexpected um, emergent consequences. So in a way, trying to think about what those images were um, has, it, it's kind of underpinned a lot of my work, the Seeker, um, where this um, um, machine entity travels world virtually and um, describes what it sees. Um, you know, using machine learning and things. Um, that was that was another way of thinking about that. Um, the work that I was just gone live um, online, uninvited. Um, my collaboration with Uber Morgan, again, is a completely different way of thinking about that. It's more of a sort of a narrative um, um, piece. It's a, it's a horror film for machines. So it's sort of taking the sort of narrative of. Um, where these sort of in, incredibly complex system um, is sort of pulled together through uh, virally through a, a botnet and botnets are like basically sort of human controlled massive collections of machines which have been hijacked by viruses and then they're used to attack other machines. Um, and most of my backdoor images were from those things. Uh, but the idea of this, this then a sort of creature that emerges from that, and that was a sort of uninvited organism and then um, and the horror film part in a way is it looking is it trying to make sense of the world and looking at you know um, um, all the inputs from its sensors um, and responding yeah no, I think that was a long answer sorry <laughs> no no that's fine it's great so um, I mean I think for me it definitely it does it underpin all your work I suppose because I knew that so beautifully chronologically mm. as well but also it, I think it's interesting that you say that you know you're trying to work out what those images are and then and then you're sort of doing that with the later works because I think you're doing that for everyone else as well because you know you give it's you know you're not you're not giving a personality to these machines and these kind of but, but a lot of this is beyond certainly beyond me and beyond <laughs> us and so if you're sort of you know the, the sort of software and the, the you know the the, the workings of of it and, and it you by you sort of I mean, you're not personifying it, but you're by making these machines and you've kind of gone a little, some, in some ways more literal. I mean, you know, the seeker, it then had a, like an actual entity, didn't it? You know, oh. it was a thing and then it had a voice. And yeah, actually, I think that makes it really, it's really helpful for everyone else to try and understand those things that, that you understand. But even, but it was very reassuring to hear even you don't understand them sometimes. <laughs> so like your work is kind of working that out, which is great. Um, yeah. Which I guess is what we're all trying to do because, you know no one really un understood how much they were unleashing I don't think with the web and then with <laughs> surveillance and, and, and no no absolutely and I've, I've actually find myself constantly sort of re-evaluating and rewriting um trying to describe what that was there and what what it is that in the light of what we currently understand of the kind of infrastructure we live in but it sort of keeps changing because you know nobody knew and now maybe we know something more but we see so it's um uh in a way the sort of conceptual the description of it keep changing and the way i think of it keeps changing but yeah it's so complicated it's um making these works is kind of the best way that i can think of of actually trying to trying to understand yeah um, which is a lot of you know all sorts of media and art 
is, is that really, isn't it? Trying to understand or better our understanding of the world in some way. So yeah, yeah, and also maybe not understanding because I think some things you can't understand, but with when you make a an artwork, it can give you a way or a kind of insight, which is not necessarily the same as a kind of logical understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, I mean, I had another thought about um, the way you and I think other artists um, are also, you know, playing with technology and data and in a way kind of um, democratizing data, um, you know, the increased awareness of artists, um, you know, sort of reappropriating the advances of the tech world. Um, you know, which I thought almost is a bit like how the futurists did, right? You know, they took um, kind of, you know, industri industri industrial technology and then kind of used it, you know, in everything they did. Um, and what a lot of artists working with tech are. Um, I was reading about this artist called um, Gretchen Andrews. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she manipulates SEO, so search engine right. optimization, to make her images appear in places that she wants them. So if you like search, I can't remember what it is, you know, Freeze Los Angeles, like yeah. her paintings appear and they never were in Freeze Fair. Um, <laughs> I like that. So sort of really interesting. And this idea yeah. of kind of, you know, democratizing data because, you know, now you can sort of hack in if, if you know how. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I wondered if you sort of thought about that in your work as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really interesting um, way of looking at it. I mean, most of what I do, I am taking, you know, technical business systems um, and using it in ways that it wasn't intended to be used. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a kind of, yeah, I, I find that a very interesting and, and satisfying thing to do to kind of wrestle out these, these tools and then just kind of, I get no fuck about with them and just push them in ways that they weren't intended to be pushed. I think that's, um, that's, that's, that's just a really interesting thing to do because there's a, I mean, one of the things that interests me so much about these is all of these sort of software platforms, infrastructure, they all contain these kind of power dynamics in terms of the sort of things that they allow and the things that they disallow. Um, and these power dynamics are, tend not to be kind of explicit. Um, so I think, you know, actually sort of taking and repurposing these things can be a kind of interesting way and in just sort of um, diving into that. Definitely. I mean, even the idea of surveillance, you know, it's, it's, it's watching people, isn't it? And I know, you know, Backdoor was looking at personal cameras, but, you know, a lot of it isn't. It's just looking at the satellites and what's, you know, around us and that we have no control and, um, you know, and it's the same for search engine stuff and, you know, all of this data, which is essentially, it's made for businesses to better understand us and follow us, right, and, oh. and track us. So I think there's something really exciting about you changing the power dynamic and the agency, um, you know, and giving it to you as the artist, but also then to the machines, you know, by giving, by sort of the randomness of it, some of your work, you know, the way it searches. And um, it's definitely, it's, yeah, satisfying is a good word for it because it is satisfying and it's a bit sort of, yeah, changing it up, which is nice, <laughs> putting the power in some different hands. Um, I wonder if anyone else has any questions. This is a nice time to bring in um, or thoughts even on our discussion. Anyone else from our group? You can ask on the chat or raise your hand. Um, there we go. <laughs> no, I, I just have a, a sort of a topical comment, perhaps. Um, but, but given the events that, are, of, that have happened in the United States over the past couple of weeks, um, do you have any plans for um, tearing down that wall at some point? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question. Uh, well, um, I doubt that it's going to be Biden's first priority. I mean, yes, you're right. When I when I made the wall, um, it was um, it was too, you know we were looking ahead to the U.S. elections and um, naively at the time we were thinking, oh yeah, I was thinking you know oh, the wall is going to be a major issue. You know, I I hadn't quite expected what 2020 would bring. Um, 
but of course you know it's the wall in the states is, is just like the most famous example but in fact border walls um uh, proliferating um, all around the world um, and we actually now have um, border more border walls I think than at the height of the Cold War yeah. so um, you know it's not just the American the you know the US Mexican one obviously is, mo is the highest profile one but actually this is a, a it's a global trend so when all of those come down yes yeah <laughs> but I just thought you know that the idea of the wall being built at this time or yeah. you know over the last x 12 months or whatever it took you to build um it just seemed very very uh, appropriate at this time in in our contemporary life you know that 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 the wall building was sort of a very um obvious thing that was happening everywhere and it's but let's hope it you know let's hope it's an you know there are things in the pipeline that are going to change that perhaps yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it is an interesting, I mean, um, Mars, the reason I put the, I was very interested in border, my reason I put the wall on Mars in a way, it was because I wanted to talk about um, the kind of physicality of the border wall and this kind of blunt imposition of politics onto geography. Um, but I wanted to do it in a way which didn't tie into a particular political status quo. And I thought, okay, what, where would be the most ridiculous place to put a wall? Um, and that was where I came up with Mars. But actually, it's also, um, you know, um, in, a, a, in theory, Mars belongs to all of us, and there's an international treaty that says so. But um, in, practic in practical terms, of course, this treaty is utterly unenforceable. Um, and you can already um, see, I think there was a con some contracts just started to be awarded to, for mining on, um, on the moon. Um, and, you know, not that I'm kind of saying that's a terrible thing, but um, the, you know, the sort of the, 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 the land struggles for Mars, um, I imagine will be something we will see a lot more of in the kind of coming decades. So, you know, maybe I'll keep my area of Mars because, you know, maybe it's going to be, it's going to make me a zillionaire. <laughs> Sorry, does somebody have a question? There's one on the chat. Oh. Um, okay. I don't know if you can see it, um, Nai, but does the Mars, this is from Diane Bauer. Um, so does the Mars will trace any particular border? Um, she hasn't seen the whole film, mm. but does it at any point show um, that God's eye view, so the, the bird's eye view as well as the wall? No, the Mars, it's a, it, you are only, you are trapped by the wall. So uh, when I was making it, I was thinking very much of that kind of dynamic of, okay, the bird's eye wall view when the wall is just aesthetics and then the, um, the view when you are physically, in a way, and embodiedly affected by the wall. Um, so that was the, um, so, and then in the end, that was the, that was the view that I decided to go for. And I think it kind of had something to do with um, lockdown you know my wall got bigger and bigger and bigger as lockdown progressed um and i went when i originally started i actually started by mapping the um u.s mexican wall onto mars and i thought that might be an interesting way to start but i um i moved away from that i'm partly because i think the um, u.s mexican wall when you map it onto mars it doesn't go over anything very interesting um, and I really actually did want that kind of visceral, um, you know, the experience of moving across the, the Martian landscape to, you know, be something which you could kind of, in a way, physically feel, um, which I think, you know, you, you obviously you get a lot more in the gallery than you would online. Yeah, we definitely feel it in the gallery, sort of imposing. And it's, okay. and it's a real juxtaposition because obviously... Mars is such an unknown landscape and so it's so exciting and freeing and to be there in a way and to be able to see it but then you do have this massive black and obviously the sound and that yeah so it's a good good um yeah very good thanks Diane yeah. anyone else have a question yeah um I don't know if I'm on um uh, I'm also, I'm just seeing it online. I'm not seeing it in the gallery. Um, unfortunately, you know, too bad. 
<laughs> and um, nice to meet you. It's too bad Hello. I didn't meet you. Um, but I guess it's just a follow-on question to oh. that question is to the previous one is, is there any kind of like geographical features or areas that you're including inside the territory or is, are there, is there anything that you're excluding? Like, is there, like, did you pick a particular region for any particular reason? Um, I actually, um, I actually moved around, um, through a number of interesting regions. Um, and yeah, and in the end, I, I ended up by um, grabbing just a chunk of Olympus Mons because I thought that would be prime real estate. What is that part? Olympus Mons. So that's the right at the end um, where yeah. you go up and then you look down into that massive crater. So this is, this is the thing, which is the um, highest volcano in the solar system. Okay. And then when you're at the top, you're actually, you're outside of the atmosphere. Um, so anyway, I thought, you know, if I'm going to grab a part of Mars, Clearly, I want that to be to be part of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, but my, my 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 choices for the areas I grabbed were um, they were they, they I was I was really looking at the ones that interested me most. I mean, there are certain areas which are more heavily watched than others. I mean, you can kind of see if you go on to um, the. Google Earth, Mars, and some areas have been really um, examined in detail and some hardly touched at all. Um, so I guess I kind of think of the ones that have been examined in detail, you know, there's probably something something worth having there. Um, but I was also, you know, interested in that whole kind of idea of um, how the kind of um, owning the appearance of something and the relationship between owning the appearance of something and actually owning the thing itself, which when it's something we can't physically touch is, is, is quite a strong relationship. Um, so yeah, that, that was, so that, that was one of the other things that, that informed me was, was looking at areas that um, were sort of considered uh, particularly um, worth examining in more detail. But if you have a look at um, the little subtitles, um, you can actually see the um, you can see the the various the regions that um, I've I've claimed areas of. We should say as well that the other good thing about experiencing it in the gallery is there um nice made um three or I think four now um beautiful prints um sort of images um of of it's of the satellite imagery right they're just really beautiful um stills. Um, and basically they're, they're sort of tagged as land deeds of Mars. So you can own your very own piece of Mars um, if, um, if you buy one of these prints. And it's, yeah, it's just really playing with that idea of ownership, I guess, because, I mean, we own all sorts of things that we can't own. I mean, you know, money, half of money is in the ether, right? And it's not physical. And um, yeah, this idea of um, land and owning a bit of Mars, but they're very, they're on, I think, um, the Visions Programme 2 webpage, you can have a look at them there as well. I'm just worth looking at actually, because it's um just it's another another view of Mars. They're kind of more aerial actually, Diane, sort of yeah, you get a bit more of a bird's eye with them, I guess. Um, because the walls, the wall's not there, right? I'm right in saying yeah, that. they're basically they're, they're like conventional land deeds in a yeah. way. They've just got a snapshot of the piece yeah. of land that you would be buying. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you can own a little bit of Mars, guys, too. Exactly. Um, <laughs> um, any, any other... create, sorry, Sophie. No, no. <laughs> I was just going to say you buy full non-exclusive creative ownership of that that portion of land. Exactly. There we go. Yeah, they're one-offs. I should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't try and sell two pieces of the same land. Absolutely <laughs> not. Uh, that would be unethical. No, no, exactly. <laughs> um, any other questions from anyone? No, no, I don't think so. Is, um, is there um, anything else you'd like to say, Nai? I know you very, mentioned very briefly your new work, Uninvited. Um, where can people see that? Um, oh, um, to... Uninvited is actually, um, it's a, well, it, it exists in the real world. So it's actually a system um, um, which is in quarantine in Furtherfield Gallery in East London, but the only way that you can actually experience it is online. 
So um, if you go to uninvited.icu, um, that's just letter I, letter C, I, letter U, um, then you can actually um, watch the uninvited organism um, in quarantine, um, revisiting its memories of the world and um, scaring itself. Is it scary? You say it's a horror film. Yeah, it is a horror film. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's scary and, um, you know, it's a, uh, um, but I think, uh, yeah, other people seem to find it scary. It's certainly de it's designed to certainly be, be scary. It's using the kind of tropes of, of horror films, but it's trying to think about them from a, like a non-human perspective. Right. Yeah, so, you know, what, what would what would scare a machine was the sort of our starting point yeah which is interesting in itself yeah oh, i'll have to go and look um, can i have should... another question on that actually hey diane hi how are you nice to see you yeah you too um i don't know i keep thinking about this is something you mentioned when you were speaking before but also around this um the horror film which I have not seen and I remember talking about it with you ages ago mm -hmm. and I love this idea of machine agency and I guess what is my question my question I suppose is having not having seen it yet do you feel that you end up with like a an empathy for the machine intelligence or or is it sort of you, you it's it's horror for you and the machine or um like, do you do you end up? I, I guess that's the yeah. question. Yeah. End up having a degree of empathy for for what agency there there might be there, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I do. I that's a that's an interesting question. I mean, the kind of machine or the uninvited network organism, as we um, sort of conceived it, basically it is. As I mentioned, it's the um, it's a sort of emergent. Um, consciousness from a botnet gone wrong um with that kind of appalling sort of genesis into life that it was it would it came into being um as something designed to destroy its peers which is is a kind of is a really horrible way for a kind of uh, an entity to it to, 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 to come into being um but the the network the Now, did I, did everyone else do sound or is that just me? No, I, it's everyone actually. Sorry, now your sound. Um... You know what? I think it's because I, I, I lent back. Um, I went too far away from my camera. Sorry. Um, where, where... There we go. Much better. Loud and clear again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just a bit had to be zoomed in. Um, so, where what 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 where where was I? Um, I was like just saying that um, you know as humans were sort of. Um, inextricably entangled into this network um, and as a result there's kind of human data um, and you know human beings are, are part of this network. Um, I think possibly it, yes I probably did um, feel empathy for the system. We, we, we've called the kind of system the monster um, a classic horror film um, um, protagonist, but um, because I had to think really hard about what would generate the horror for the machine, I think it was very hard to avoid feeling um, empathy. And that is a kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? That um, idea of um, feeling empathy for a machine and also how easy it is to make humans empathize with things. You know, I think that's, I mean, like in, um, what was it? Is it AI, that, that film where the guy falls in love with the robot and frees her and then she locks him in a concrete vault. Um, but our kind of, our responses, we're, we're, we're very susceptible to that. Aren't oh, we? yeah. Blade Runner. It just made me think actually, with Diane asking about empathy, because often it's, 
often it's the machines turn bad, isn't it? You know, in the horror. And would you are you, are you thinking about making a romance for them now, <laughs> or something more friendly? <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody um, did actually ask why why we made a horror film and not say a romantic comedy um, but I guess the reason was is that the piece had um, its genesis in again in the sort of in the um, these backdoored um, with surveillance images these images that I'd, I'd, I'd collected and um, you know, we were looking through these images and they have the kind of quality of horror film stills. Yeah. Um, and I think that's possibly something to do with the notion of the unseen watcher. Yeah. Um, so that's, um, that, that was in a way, that was the kind of thing that triggered the whole kind of, okay, horror film um, for machines. But then it just became a really interesting kind of conceptual structure to think about, to try to think about, about uh, machine agency. Um, so everything about the kind of um, the way that the system operates, you know, from a sort of a cultural narrative and this sort of infrastructure of um, surveillance, um, you know, there's a kind of cultural horror and then the sort of the, the way that the um, we envisage this um, entity coming into being is quite violent as well. Um, yeah. I, so it, it was always it was always going to be a horror film and I can't imagine making a rope because I think horror film kind of keeps you it keeps a kind of level of detachment and one of the things that we really wanted to do was do that kind of impossible thing of not anthropomorphizing you know you can't help it um, but um, that kind of structure gave us the sort of the distance to try to, um, you know, to, to, to minimise that. Yeah. I don't know if I've directly answered your question, Diane. Um, no, yeah. I mean, I think definitely. I mean, I think, I think one of the things that, that, that is really interesting though, is like when, that, that you can probably have empathy without anthropomorphizing or, or can you have, can, can you have, can you leave the anthropomorphizing while still having empathy? I mean, because it becomes more and more of a political question as like things like AI develop and like at what point, at what point is it an ethical question that, you know, we ought to have empathy for an intelligence? Like in what level of complexity deserves empathy? Oh. You know, it's, whether it's, um, whether we anthropomorphize it or not, you know. Um, yeah, it becomes really interesting, doesn't it? I was, I saw a really interesting um, talk um, last year, I think, about AI suffering. Um, and um, I, I'll send you the, the link if you, if you like, but the guy who was talking about it, his name slips online, but it's in my notes. Um, he was saying that the kind of precondition for an AI achieving consciousness in any way we understand it um, would have to be the ability to suffer. Because in order to achieve consciousness with his argument, it would need to have a sense of itself. And if it has a sense of itself, then it has a sense of a kind of state preference. Um, and then if it has a sense of a state preference, then it would then suffer in some way if, it, if that state preference is not, um, is not maintained. Um, so, but I thought that was that was a really interesting way of of looking at it, which is why I think the idea of a, of a horror film for an AI is is itself so interesting because it, it sort of brings up all of that, right? I mean, it's like it, that's like already baked in, you know, in, into the into the project in some ways. It sounds like, um, yeah. Anyway, it just that's cool. yeah, yeah. That's that's really interesting, though. Thank you. Thanks. I think um, any any other questions before we kind of draw to a close? I think that is it. Well, thanks, Mai. That was brilliant. I really enjoyed that chatting to you. Oh, thank you. That was really good. We've we've gone massively over time, haven't we? But it was yeah, just an sorry, interesting conversation. Um, people probably did leave if they had dinner and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's been yeah. Thank you for that. I've really enjoyed chatting. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks, thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you to Nye. Thanks to Safia, obviously, for setting everything up. 
um, as well. And um, and yeah, so we, I mean, keep keep um, keep online basically. Um, checking back um, to the visions in the nunnery page to see um, if if you are able to make it to the gallery and you'd like to. And we will definitely let you know um, whether we reopen, hopefully maybe on the 3rd of December um, or not. Um, and then hopefully following NISE, if we can open, we'll have programme three as well, where we've got um, the great Benedict Drew um, leading that. So, um, so yeah, that would be great. But yes, thank you, everyone. And mm. have a very good evening. Um, thanks, okay. Sophie. Thanks, Nia. Thanks, thank Safi. <laughs> we'll see you later, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> see you, everyone. Thank you ever so much for, for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Have a lovely evening.